No, I didn't propose a freeze. Look, we're talking about it. Time. Hey, uh, Joey Brown, I started early. Guys, you, you can't help but attract these demons, these sons of the devil. You, <clears throat> without fail. Hey, uh, Joey Brown, instead of barking in the text, are you listening? Are you are you listening, Joey Brown? You can't either. Even if I start, a demon shows up. Trinitarian Mafia, right? Hey, Joey Brown, I'm talking to you. Don't waste my time. Sorry, guys. You can't help but attract demons than devils. This year, Joey Brown. Hello, Joey Brown. This year, Joey Brown. Yoo -hoo. Can you guys hear me? Joey Brown. Come here, girl. Can you guys hear me? Sorry. It does not fail. Okay. Uh, Joey Brown. Can you get this guy? Hi, Boris Duckett. That's easy. We got another demon, Boris. Guy who's manifesting and foaming, and I got a Muslim. Okay. Joey Brown. Hello, Joey Brown. Can you tell the guy I'm going to block him if he doesn't respond? Sorry, guys. Okay. No, you are you are a demon. You're probably not the most wicked demon, but you are ugly. Okay. Joey Brown, are you here to start trouble? Because I'm going to have you call my Skype, and it's going to take less than 10 minutes to deal with you. Are you here to learn? Okay. Joey, stop with the emotion. Wow. Wow. Jay, look at that. Wow. Oh. Huh. It doesn't work here. Okay. It, Joey, appealing to emotion doesn't work here. You're not going to get far with your silliness. Okay. If you're here to listen, do not use emotive language and call Trinitarians Trinitarian Mafia. See, if you're here to learn, you're not going to egg people on and insult them by calling them the Trinity Mafia. Okay. When you come in with that spirit, when you come in with that attitude, you're asking to get decimated. That's what you're asking for. I don't mind people coming in with objections, arguments that they want answers to. I don't mind. What I do mind, here's what I mind. Someone comes in my channel, starts attacking the brethren, starts attacking Trinitarians, Start mocking their faith, <clears throat> mocking their God, and perverting scripture. That is going to get you a beatdown. Okay? That's going to get you a beatdown. You want to hear and learn? And if you want to ask me 50,000 questions and objections by the power of Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, I'll answer you, and I'll show you respect if you show respect. Okay? Number one, Joey Brown, I don't know who told you we believe Jesus is the Father. Okay, where did you get that Trinitarians believe Jesus is the father? Guys, let me just help this man benefit. If he's sincere, I want to show him respect and love and he can learn. Okay, where did you get that Trinitarians believe Jesus is the father? I read one of your comments. You said Jesus is God and he's not God the father. That's what Trinitarians believe. Is that what you believe? Do you believe Jesus is God, but he's not God the father? Okay, that's what we believe. So why are you attacking us and calling us Trinity Mafia? Who told you Trinitarians believe Jesus is the Father? You see? You came in here attacking, calling people Trinity Mafia, not knowing what they believe, assuming they believe something that they don't. And you see, and you wonder why we're getting angry and animated. No, we don't believe Jesus is three persons. We believe Jesus is God the Son. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three persons, not people, are the one God. You don't believe Jesus is the Holy Spirit, right? You don't believe Jesus is the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is not Jesus, right? He's not, an, he's not a Muslim. 
Yeah, Sean, hold on, brother. One second. Okay, so that's right. So he represents Jesus, speaks on behalf of Jesus. He's not Jesus, right, Joey? He represents Jesus, speaks on behalf of Jesus, but he's not Jesus, right? He's a Trinitarian. He doesn't even know it. Just wait, guys. Let me just suggest <clears throat> what he's saying, because this guy confused me. I think, I th I'm thinking he's going to attack the Trinity. Okay, so Joey, you know you're a Trinitarian? You know that, right? That's what the Trinity teaches, what you just believe. So why are you attacking Trinitarians for believing what you believe? <sighs> oh, my goodness. Why are you attacking Trinitarians when they believe what you believe? So, okay, let's, let's, let's work this out, okay? Joey, Jesus is not the Father. You agree? No, we don't say that, man. Stop putting words in our mouth. Jesus is not the Father, right, Joey? Listen to me and don't ignore me. Okay. But do you believe Jesus is God? Okay. And you believe the Holy Spirit is not a creature, right? He's not created? The Holy Spirit is not a creature, right? Now, I don't know by title. Let's try this again. Is the Holy Spirit a creature? Thank you, Joey. So the Holy Spirit is not a creature. He's eternal. And Jesus is God in nature. He has the attributes of God. Does Jesus have the attributes of God, even though he's not the Father? So do you believe Jesus has the attributes of God, even though he's not the Father? Yeah, wh wh I, whatever literal means in your own mind, I don't. you don't even believe that. But anyway, is Jesus God in nature without being the Father? He has the attributes of God, but he's not the Father, right? Right, Joey? Just want to make sure. Okay, guys, the guy's a Trinitarian, and he's attacking Trinitarians. Did you just catch it? That's what the Trinity teaches, Joey. The guy's a Trinitarian, even though he just attacked Trinitarians. Go figure. And you get me animated for nothing. You get me worked up for nothing because I think you're going to blaspheme the Trinity, and you're a Trinitarian, though you don't use the term. Because, Stephen, he doesn't know what the Trinity means. He doesn't use the term. He wants to stick with biblical language, but that's the Trinity. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, but the Son is not created. And Jesus is the Son who has the attributes of God. That's the Trinity. No, the group that was attacking you, Joey, they were not Trinitarians. They're called modalists. There's a difference. They're modalists. They believe Jesus is the human manifestation of the Father. That's not Trinitarianism. We condemn that view as a false teaching of the devil, a satanic lie. Modalism is a lie from the pit of hell. No, with all due respect to you, I will not refrain from insulting and mocking someone who attacks the Trinity. Okay, Joey? No, you don't know me. When someone attacks the Trinity and attacks the integrity and <clears throat> glory of Jesus, I'm going to get animated because I love Jesus, though, to my shame, I don't love him as much as I should. But I love him enough that I will tear you to shreds if you rob Jesus of his glory. Okay? The group that was stopping you, the group that was stopping you, they are called modalists. They're not Trinitarian. Are you listening, Joey? The group that was attacking you, they're modalists. They're not trin Trinitarian. They believe Jesus is the human appearance of the Father. They believe Jesus is the Father in human appearance. Are you with me there, Joey? Don't confuse us with them. They're heretics. You're a Trinitarian whether you realize it or not. Okay, see what you do? 
Trinitarian Mafia. You know you're calling for a fight and egging people on when you call Trinitarians Mafia. Ask questions. Learn what we believe. And it's not just Jesus. It's what Jesus' apostles and their followers taught you by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Joey, because you believe in the New Testament. And many of the books of the New Testament were written by the apostles and their followers by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you believe all that Jesus revealed, not just what Jesus said when he was on earth. Okay? What a way to start the channel, man. Okay. Now, Joey, if you watch my sessions and you read my articles, you will have ample biblical proof Biblical evidence, biblical arguments showing the Trinity is true because you believe in the Trinity, even though you didn't know what the Trinity means. You with me there? You get me animated. I'm already feeling like I'm going to have a heart attack and be with Jesus sooner than later. And David Wood is a Trinitarian, Joey Brown. John, now let me answer John's question. Hold on. <clears throat> Depends on what you mean by subornationism, John. You're throwing out a term, John, John, and assuming there's only one definition of subornationism. What do you mean by subornationism, John? And A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. What has Jesus being the everlasting father got to do with him being God the father? No, Mexican, there are people younger than me that have heart attacks. We're one heartbeat away. Okay, Jean, what do you mean by subornationism? A, B, C, D, F, G. Do you want to go uh, to another channel? You want me to send you on your merry way? You want to get out of here? Because I've done sessions on what it means for Jesus to be everlasting father and have an article. Don't expose your ignorance to me. If you don't want to learn, then get out of here. Oh, yeah? Okay, here, call me. Here, let me debate you. Call me so I, call me so I can muzzle you on that. Here you go. Go ahead. Well, guys, we got another demon who's going to get muzzled. Call me right now. And you better not be talking over me and screaming or I'm going to block you. So call. Be a man and call so we can have some fun. Okay? If you talk over me, I'm going to block you. So you're going to listen. Thank you, George. Come on. You got a good bark, but call. Come on. I'm waiting for another anti-Trinitarian to call me. He's not calling me. A guy named Avinash Fernandez. When the comment section was very brave and big and tough. They're all tough behind the screen. Come on, ABC, so I can make you W, X, Y, and Z. ABC, call me so I can make you W, X, Y, and Z. And you better listen and answer questions or I'm going to muzzle you. Yeah. ABC, come out to play. <laughs> I'm waiting. Are you going to call me ABC so I can make you W, X, Y, and Z? Are you going to call? Or are you wasting our time? Tell me what you're going to do because I need to begin. I don't have time for kids. My time because I got to go live stream with Al. Are you going to call ABC? We're waiting. A, B, C, come out to play. <laughs> come out to play, A, B, C. <laughs> do you guys know why I do that, by the way? <clears throat> Does anyone? Uh, depends on what you want to call me about, uh, Joey. Clam down, Sam. Why don't you call me and clam me down, you clown? Come and put me in my place, ABC. Please clam me down because I want to muzzle you. You're barking. Bow, wow, wow. Yippee, yay, yippee, yo. Snoop Dogg and dog. All right. I do that because we got some nuts, some anti-Trinitarian heretics, sons of Satan. They take clips of me. And they post those clips and say, look, Sam's manifesting. He proves he's demon-possessed. There was this one modalist, heretic, anti-Trinitarian, 
Sam manifest that he's got a demon, right? So I I I want to keep their YouTube channels relevant. So here, you anti-Trinitarian dogs, and that's what you are. You are dogs. When you attack the Trinity and mock the true Jesus and pervert the scripture, no matter how many times you've been corrected, then you are truly from the pit of hell. Satan is truly your father. You are dogs <clears throat> need, that need to be muzzled <clears throat> and not <clears throat> be given anything that is sacred. So for you dogs, here, I'll give you some clips. ABC, come out to play. <laughs> Manifesting. Cheating. Oh, man. It's fun, isn't it? We're going to begin in a minute. We're going to begin in prayer. right? I like that. that I do it too naturally, don't I? Uh, Joey Brown, Chris LaSala. Let me correct that because someone was telling me. So I, Chris LaSala turned out to be a snake. He turned out to be a son of Satan and a, and a coward. Why? Because when I went on a show, I did three shows with him. Listen to this, Joey Brown, everyone else. The first show, him and his buddy got manhandled, but I was very nice when I manhandled him. Second show was on Soul Sleep. In that stream, he repented. It's there. Someone downloaded it because he removed it from his YouTube channel out of shame. He admit, you're right. The Bible teaches that when a person dies, he still continues to exist consciously without a body. And he repented of Soul Sleep. He repented of it. Okay. We did a third talk. And he didn't record the third talk. The third talk, he didn't record. The first two he did, but the second one he removed. A certain historian, do you understand when you want to bark like a dog? Ya kalba, mukhramma. You understand you're going to embarrass yourself because you got Orthodox and you got Catholic that think the Assyrian historian church is a bunch of heretics. Because you were condemned as heretics. So you shouldn't be talking about apostate. Ya kalba mukhramma. You're a disgrace to the church and to the blood of the Assyrian martyrs. Because you're a dog that you bark. Because if you're going to go by that standard, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church condemned you because you denied that Mary is the mother of God. And they accuse you of blaming there is two persons. Ya kalba mukhramma. Someone who lives in a doghouse needs to stop barking when he's teethless. Ya kalba mukhramma. You wicked dog. I'm ashamed that you're a Syrian. And I'm going to prove it to you. that So they can muzzle you. The Orthodox here and the Catholic here. Is it not true that the church of the East called the Nestorian church is condemned as heretics? Anna Groin, can you tell this dog, who's a fellow Syrian that I'm embarrassed for, that his church is condemned as a heretical church? Ya kalba mukhramma, you're a disgrace to your mother. I hope you see me face to face and talk tough to my face. Don't be a tough guy behind the screen with a fake account. Kelba Mukhramma, disgrace to my people and to the blood of my, my martyrs, the Assyrians. You try to be nice to these dogs and they bark. Yeah. And he has the audacity called the Protestants heretics. And yet he knows, he knows that the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, even the Coptics condemn his church. Because the Assyrian church refused to call Mary the mother of God. They said the mother of Christ. And because they're accused of believing in two persons. And I'm not saying they're right. But when people live in glass houses, they're the last ones to be throwing stones. Ya kalba mukhramma. Assyrian historian, change your name. You're a disgrace to the Nestorian church and to the blood of those martyrs. Iwit kalbit satana ya mukhramma. And you're not a man. You're a man behind the screen. Give me your name. So we can know who you are if you see me face to face. Coward. Anyway, sorry guys. The demons are manifesting. Fellow Assyrian from the church of my, my parents and my ancestors. And he comes in here and he accuses me of being a heretic. The audacity of this lowlife dog when he knows that the Orthodox and the Catholic condemn the Assyrian church, the church of the East, for heresies, not saying they're right, because in 1994, the then patriarch, Mardin Khada IV, went and met the then Pope, John Paul, to squash this accusation that the Nestorian Church are heretics by agreeing that the Nestorian Church with the Catholic Church believes there's one Christ, 
One eternal divine person who's God and man. No, actually, Wiser Green, you, you have no idea what you're talking about. Wiser Green, do you want me to educate you and show you you have no clue what you're talking about? That the title Mother of God is biblical. It is it is based in scripture. It's taken from scripture. Wiser Green? No, Joey's not a oneness. He's not. He just said Jesus is not the Father. Okay, folks, I don't want I don't want to play with these dogs. If you're a dog here, you're going to get muzzled and sent back to the doghouse. I don't have time for you kids. I don't have time for your kids, for you kids. Assyrian historian, put a one because we're going to block you. Because you're not a man. You hide behind the Assyrian church. <clears throat> sure it is, Assyrian historian, because you say so. Because you say it was written in Syriac. Now, guys, what are the odds that this dog who claims to be Assyrian, a disgrace to my people, believes the New Testament was written in Syriac when his mother tongue is Syriac? Gee. I'm a Syrian, so of course the New Testament is written Assyrian. Because you see, the Assyrian is the language of heaven. God himself spoke Assyrian before creation. You sound like a, a stupid Muslim. You sound like a stupid Muslim because that's what the Muslims tell me about Arabic. Disgrace to my people. And I just want to say to the Assyrians here and to the Assyrian church, I don't intend this to be an attack on any of you or to dishonor any of you. Wiser Green, do you understand what mother of my Lord means in the context of Luke 1? Or do I need to educate you and school you? Hold on. I'm going to have a field day. In fact, Wiser Green, can you call me so we can have a conversation on this to show that you're biblically illiterate and you don't know what the Bible teaches? Can you call me? Because I'm going to make an example out of you. What did Elizabeth mean when she called Mary the mother of my Lord in the context of Luke? Are you ready? Can you call me? Can you call me so I can educate you and show you're biblically illiterate? Hold on. Let me just deal with this guy who thinks he knows his Bible. Can you call me? Yes or no, Wiser Green? Are you going to waste my time or are you going to call me? You can read it in Syriac so you can get educated. Pfizer Green, you got 10 seconds to respond. I'm going to block you. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Sorry you're driving. Go ahead. I'm listening. How convenient. Then why are you typing while you're driving? So you're going to break the law. Guys, I want you to see. He's admitting he's driving, but he's texting. So you're going to break the law and text while you're driving, risking people's lives, but you can't call, which is safer. Did you catch it? Okay. You see they started manifesting. We didn't even begin. Thank you, Andrew. You see they started manifesting before we began, right? Okay, now. Let me real quickly say to my Assyrian brothers and sisters, listen to me. My attack on that dog, Assyrian Nestorian, is not an attack on the Assyrians or the church, the Nestorian church. The Nestorian church is the church of my parents and my grandparents and my ancestors. They were baptized in it. They got married in it. They were buried in it. So all you Assyrians, listen to me and quote me in context. I am not attacking the church of the East. I love the church of the East called the Nestorian church. It's a church of my, my family, my ancestors. I was baptized in that church. I'm attacking wicked dogs from any denomination that would be so disgraceful to dishonor their heritage and their tradition by speaking the way they do, opening themselves for embarrassment and humiliation. And I do this with Orthodox, Protestants, Catholic, Nestorian, Coptic. I don't care what your denomination is if you're a jerk and you're going to be arrogant and you're going to be rude and you're going to be nasty and put down other christians i'm going to tear you to shreds and there's nothing you can do about it because you won't refute me biblically theologically okay i just did it earlier with a catholic 
Pax Christi. Is Pax Christi here? Pax Christi, are you here? I want to make sure he's here. Pax Christi was indirectly putting down other churches because he's a Roman Catholic who believes that the Roman Catholic Church is the true church of Jesus Christ. And what did I say to Pax Christi? You need to leave. Why? Let me be clear. I love my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who are born of the Spirit from all the major Trinitarian churches. If you're an Orthodox and you're Trinitarian and you're born of the Spirit, I love you. If you're Roman Catholic and Trinitarian, born of the Spirit, I love you. If you are Nestorian, the church of my ancestors, and you're Trinitarian, born, I, lo I love all my brothers and sisters in Christ who are Trinitarian. And I don't want to turn my YouTube channel into a debate between Orthodox, Coptic, <clears throat> Catholic, Nestorian. There are YouTube channels that devote themselves entirely on attacking other groups. I used to, years ago, be very anti-Catholic. I used to be in my ignorance. I'm at a point in my Christian walk where I'm now open to the Holy Spirit guiding me into all truth, correcting me when I'm wrong, sanctifying me <clears throat> to accept what the Holy Spirit convinces me is truth from him. And so I'm at a point now where I'm open to hearing what Catholics have to say, Orthodox have to say, Coptics have to say, Nestorians have to say, if they can say it in a way where they exhume love for me as a Trinitarian, and do not look down upon me or call me a schismatic heretic. Because if you do that, don't waste your time with me. I will have nothing to do with you. Yes, even in the men of Baptist. My position won't be accepted by many people. There are going to be Roman Catholics who think <clears throat> I'm wrong for embracing Nestorians or Coptics. There are going to be Orthodox who think I'm wrong for thinking that Catholics can be brothers when they have a view of the papacy that's contrary to apostolic tradition. Friends. This is a debate I won't settle for you. This is a debate no one is going to settle until Jesus returns. Because to this day, you have Orthodox channels, YouTube channels. One of them, I forgot the name of it. Is it Orthodox Apologetics? Where they're doing series showing that the papacy is brought, based on fraud. fraud. Fraudulent documents that were concocted to give the Pope an authority that he never had. And then you have Roman Catholic <clears throat> Ap apologetic channels showing that the orthodox are wrong for breaking away from the church and denying the primacy of the pope and then you have coptic channels saying that their view of christ and how the natures relate is the correct historic apostolic view and all other views are false right you know what i'm talking about right you know what i'm talking about Am I lying, Orthodox? You are Orthodox. Is it not true you have your apologists and your YouTube channels and your writing showing the papacy is wrong, the Pope is not the vicar of Christ on earth and the successor to Peter, and all bishops are subject to him, right? Am I making this up? Am I lying? See, amen. Here's an Orthodox that says it. And yet you have Catholics here who will tell you no, the evidence of church history shows that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the successor Peter, and all bishops are subject to him on earth, and the Orthodox was wrong for breaking away. Right, Roman Catholics? Am I right? Joanna, Ariel? Okay, you see? So do you want me to turn this channel into a debate between Orthodox and Catholic and Coptic and Nestorian? Is that what you guys want me to do? Or can you go to another channel if you're Orthodox and you believe the Orthodox Church maintain the correct understanding of the teachings of the apostle and that Rome went too far? There are YouTube channels for you. Can you go there? Can you go there? There are Roman Catholic apologetic channels like Reason and Theology that will argue that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the successor to Peter, and the Orthodox Church was wrong for denying his primacy. Can you go to that channel? Not here. And then you have, then you have a Coptic channel. I was just watching it, where they say Miaphysitism 
is the true teaching of the early church fathers and deophysitism is a divergence from that truth. If you believe that, can you go to that channel? Can you go to that channel? Don't bring your divisions, your arguments here. What I want this channel to be is a channel used of the Holy Spirit to show me the true correct interpretation of Scripture and enable me to teach the correct interpretation of Scripture to the best of my ability in a very loving manner, as loving as I can possibly be without being compromising or tickling ears so I don't prostitute myself for fame or, or fortune and then let you take the information that I present, study it to see where I'm wrong and ask God to show me if I'm wrong and correct it. And whatever I say is true, benefit from it, use it in your churches to strengthen the members of your church to be sold out for the Trinity, sold out for the God-man Jesus, sold out for the divine person whom we call the Holy Spirit and in love with the scripture as the word of God, perfect and preserved and as a sure source of faith and morals. Can you help me do that? Can you help me do that? Okay. And you see, and you guys got to admit, I'm very fair. I equally offend every major branch of Christianity. If we get an Orthodox who's a jerk, I attack him. If we get a Catholic who's a jerk, I attack him. If we get an Assyrian historian like that jerk who should remove his name, he's no Assyrian, he's no historian, he's a disgrace to my church and to my people and to the martyrs of my people, I attack him. I'm an equal opportunity Hater, and I attack everyone equally because I hate everyone equally. Hello, Leila. Is that clear? I'm an equal opportunity hater. I will equally hate any one of you, bash any one of you from any denomination. You can't say, oh, he's anti-Catholic. Or he's anti-Orthodox, anti-Coptic, anti... -Coptic, anti I attack every one of you guys. If you're a jerk to me, I'm going to be a jerk to you. Do you know why? Because my weakness, my sinfulness, my imperfection is I got anger issues. When someone attacks me, my flesh kicks in. And then I hate myself for losing my testimony. I say, please, Jesus, save me from myself so I don't shame you. Wash me in your blood. Fill me with the spirit. Please, Lord. Right? And all of you got to be fair. Pax Christi, and a growing, all of you have to be fair. You can see I'm very impartial towards all of you if you're going to be honest have i shown favoritism to any one group have i that's it thank you now the purpose of the session was i was inviting a jehovah witness heretic a heretic who was running his mouth in the comment section Pax Christi, you actually did. Earlier in the beginning, don't argue with me, friend. Please don't argue. In the beginning, you were telling someone, the Roman Catholic Church, you used the word Catholic, you said Ignatius is Catholic, and the Church of Christ is Catholic, meaning Roman Catholic. And I said, don't do that here. Do you know why? Okay. Guys, there is a reason why I'm taking 20 minutes to go on this rant, because I want to help you to help me to serve you to the best of my ability for the glory of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now. Anna and the Orthodox here. Pax Christi, listen to this. The Orthodox here, can you put a one? I have a question for you, Orthodox. I have a question for the Orthodox here. Okay. The Orthodox, when you find in the writings of the Church Fathers the mention Catholicos, does that mean the Roman Catholic Church and or the Pope as the vicar of Christ, successor to Peter, or is that simply language meaning that the true apostolic church is universal, it's located everywhere? Okay, so just because they use the word Catholic doesn't mean they were Catholic in that they believe that the Bishop of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, 
is the successor of Peter, the vicar of Christ, the head of the church on earth, and everyone has to submit to his authority. That's not what they meant when they said Catholic, right? And the early church fathers, like Ignatius. That's not what they meant. Okay. So Pax Christi, you just answered your own statement. Then why do you come in here talking about the Catholic Church when you meant Roman Catholic, don't lie to me because you're Roman Catholic and you're trying to prove Ignatius was Roman Catholic as, a, as opposed to he was Catholic in the sense that he believed the church of Jesus is universal because the apostles went out throughout the entire world by the power of the Holy Spirit establishing the church of Jesus Christ on earth. Now, whether the Pope is the vicar of Christ or not, this is not the channel to debate it. Let me repeat it again. This is not the channel to debate it. There are channels, reason and theology. Jay Dyer, who's a convert to the Orthodox Church, a brilliant Christian philosopher, go there. They debate these issues. I'm not here to debate those issues because, number one, I'm not qualified to debate these issues. I'm not an expert on church history. I'm a student who depends on the experts to learn, which is why I listen to a variety of voices. Now, Pax Christi, because you want to play games with me, brother, do you believe the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth and the successor to Peter and that all bishops must submit to his authority? See, again, Pax Christi is playing games with me. Yeah, I'm going to have to block you, Pax Christi. Pax Christi, do you believe, and does Vatican II deny, that the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth, the successor Peter, and all bishops are subject to him? Okay, Sharabu, God bless you, brother. And I'm not saying you're wrong or right. It's Okay, so Pax Christi, can, you just said yes. Guys, he said yes. So can you stop the game? So when you want to talk about the Catholic Church, you're talking about not simply their Byzantine. You're saying the Catholic Church in that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, successor of Peter, and all bishops are subject to him. So stop the games with me. That's what you believe. I am not ignorant. Okay? You see, he still, he still wants to tap dance. Every bishop is the figure of Christ. You know what I meant by the term vicar of Christ, meaning that he is supreme. All bishops are subject to him. Okay, let me, final time. People get telling me, see, you waste so much time when you don't, okay, final time. Listen to me. If you're Catholic, you believe that? That's between you and God. If you're Orthodox, you deny that? That's between you and God. This is not, let me try it again. This is not the channel to debate those issues because the Orthodox come here not to hear me criticize the Orthodox belief or the Catholic belief. That's not my calling. I'm not qualified. Can you leave me at peace? Let me teach in those areas that the Holy Spirit has qualified me in. And if you want to debate whether the papacy is biblical and ancient, find channels that do that. Can, can you leave me be and let me focus on my areas of specialty, which I trust by the Holy Spirit is biblical exegesis, interpretation of the Bible, the Trinity, the two natures of Christ. He's the God man, the divine person, Holy Spirit, the inspiration of scripture. These are the areas I'm comfortable talking about. Don't make me talk about issues I haven't spent time, spent time addressing. I'm going to be on Jay Dyer's <clears throat> show this Thursday. Talking about Messianic prophecy, Ortho Christos. He invited me this Thursday. I'm going to be on. I was also on the Catholic apologetics channel, Reason and Theology. You see, I'm like that. I'm an eco opportunist. I'll go anywhere and everywhere to benefit all Trinitarians with the knowledge God has given me for the glory of the triune God. So can you leave me be? Can you let me? Focus on the topics I'm comfortable addressing and don't get me into this debate. Can we do that? 
Okay, so we're done now with that. Do not use my channel as a platform to prop up your church as the one true church and all the other church as heretics or schismatics. Can you not do that in my channel, please? Can we not do that here, please? There are channels for that. There's an Orthodox apologetics channel that did two live streams on how the papacy is based on fraudulent documents. And then you got Catholic channels responding to that. This, folks, let me just remind you. Okay, Pax Christi. Brother, you, you have to go, honestly, bro. I'm sorry, but you have to go. You're a stumbling block to me. You have to go to another channel. Go to Reason and Theology or the Catholic Answers channel. This is not for you, brother. You need to go. Okay, brother, God bless you. Leave. I wish you Godspeed. Okay? I wish you Godspeed. Thank you, Billy Mandali. I like that. The Jeet Kune Do. All right. So now, guys, I wasted 40 minutes of your time, and I hope it wasn't a waste. I wasted 40 minutes of your time to try to let you know, don't use my channel as a platform to prop what you believe at the expense of other churches. Don't do that. It's sad that I, someone who's not Catholic or Orthodox Coptic, I'm more zealous and defending these other churches, right, from the accusation by one particular group of being heretics or schismatics. And it's ironic. If you had asked me 20 years ago, I actually would be refuting, let's say, an Orthodox attacking a Catholic or a Catholic attacking Orthodox. I'd say you're nuts. You, I would tell you you're nuts. And here I am doing it right now. And this all started, by the way, folks, I just want you to know, this all started because of that Assyrian historian. To my fellow Assyrians, you are my people, you are flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, because we are Assyrians, and I love you, and I love the Assyrian church. I love the church of my parents and my ancestors. My church gave up many martyrs for the glory of Jesus Christ, and I will never dishonor that church. I will never disrespect that church. I will never do it. I'll die before I do that. And I'm not saying it in front of you because I want to be a crowd pleaser. I love my church, the church of the East, the church of my ancestors, the church of my parents. I'm about to cry because <clears throat> that's the church my mother got baptized in. That's the church my mother got married in. And that's the church my mother was buried in. That's the church that my mother baptized me in. It's a church of my ancestors. It's a church of my parents. I love that church. I love my people. I love my parents. My attack was on this jerk giving the Assyrian historians a bad name. Giving the Assyrian historians a bad name. Don't you call yourself Assyrian or historian if you're a jerk and you're a nasty jerk that's going to bring people to attack the church of my people, the church of my parents and my ancestors. Okay, so with that said, let's begin. The church where <clears throat> my beloved mother was baptized, <clears throat> where she was married and buried. Okay. The church that gave up hundreds of thousands of martyrs for Jesus. Folks, let me remind you, Orthodox, Orthodox, you remember the Armenian Assyrian Greek genocide? See, and I just took it out of my mouth. And I just took it out of my mouth. Do you think the Muslims differentiated between the Assyrian church and the Orthodox? See, Anna, just confirmation. Do you think when the Turks and the Kurds slaughtered those beloved Armenians, slaughtered those Chaldean Catholic, the Assyrian Nestorians, slaughtered the Greeks, they said, oh, hold on, excuse me, wait, wait, you're an Assyrian historian? Oh, you're not a true Christian, put you aside. Oh, you're, or they slaughtered all of them equally because to them, they were all Trinitarians who believed in the God-man, Jesus, and the Bible is God's word. The Muslims didn't take, take a, a vote. Hold on. Um, how many historians here? Oh, wait, wait. The Orthodox and the Catholics say you're heretics, so you're not true Christian. We'll put you aside. Did they make that distinction? Did they make that distinction? 
It wasn't just one and a half a mil a million Armenian. It was Assyrians and Greeks involved as well. It's the Armenian, Assyrian, Greek genocide. Let's not go that far. Just a couple years ago, was it in Libya? How many Coptic Christians were beheaded on camera by the Muslim jihadis? Do you remember that? How many did they record in orange jumpsuits where they put the knife to their neck and beheaded them on live camera? And which one of those Christian Coptics denied Jesus? Not a single one. Not a single one. You can even hear them before they die saying, Hallelujah, Bismi Yesuh, glorifying Jesus with their last breath. And you want to, me to believe that Jesus did not honor the blood of those martyrs who were Trinitarian and believed Jesus is the God man just because of your sectarian bias and differences. Really? You want me to believe that? Come on, man. Enough of this. Yes, well, we're not attacking all the Turks, Anna. Obviously, we're not. Hatun is a Turkish warrior for Jesus. Endor is a Turkish warrior for Jesus. Now, it doesn't help that Endor does look like a big turkey, but that's not because he's from Turkey. He just looks like a plump turkey. But anyway, are we ready now? Woo. Should I have Protestant edit the first 46 minutes? Cut it out, or should I just keep it intact? ABC, you're the one who just denied that Jesus is the Son of God. You said he's the Father. And are you telling me be Catholic? Protestant, what do you guys what should I do? Should I edit this out, cut this out, or break it down into two? Edit meaning remove it or break it down into two. Should I keep this, make it a separate video, or just delete it? Keep it, make it a separate video, or delete it? Okay. Protestant, okay, let's keep the first 46 minutes as a separate video. This is my rant, so we can go into the meat of the matter. Okay. Can you do that, Protestant? So thank the mods and thank Protestant. He's the professional guy. He knows how to do all this stuff. Yeah, and yeah, Turb gave, gave a good suggestion. Okay, now, what was the purpose of today's session? Why did I do this session? Which, again, I can never do a session. Let me not say never. There have been times where I've done a session without distraction. The reason why, the reason why I decided to change topic, because I wanted to do, what does it mean to be born of water and spirit? Being born of water and spirit. But we had another Jehovah Witness, heretic, acting brave in the comments section, running his blasphemous, filthy mouth. And his name is right here. He's on Skype. I just contacted him. Avinash Fernandez, another dog of the devil, who couldn't help but mock Jesus and the Trinity, thinking he has airtight arguments. And I called him out. And here I've been contacting on Skype, Avinash, A-V-I-N-A-S-H, Avinash Fernandez. And I just contacted him, hoping he'll call so I can muzzle him for laughing and mocking and blaspheming the Trinity. So let's see if he's got a bite with his bark. So let's begin. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you and adore you. Holy Spirit, we worship you. We love you. We adore you. Holy Spirit, forgive me for all the imperfections, sins, and mistakes. And I ask for this favor for all of us. Do not let us compromise, pervert your word for the praise of men or for the love of money. Give us the power to be bold as lions and lionesses, to speak the truth without compromise as you guide us into what that truth is and give us the, the power. Holy Spirit, give us the power to love your truth and live your truth and affirm your truth and die for your truth. Please, Holy Spirit, please. And wash us in the blood of Jesus. Purify us in the blood of the Lamb. And illuminate us to understand the word. And not just understand it, but to believe it and trust in it. And live it out and proclaim it and love it and die for your word. Holy Spirit, please, we love you. We need you. We depend on you. 
Fill my lungs and chest and throat with health, Holy Spirit. Give me the health I need to be used for your glory, to glorify Jesus, to the praise and glory and honor of the Father of our Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, bless everyone here. Holy Spirit, fill everyone here. Anoint everyone here. Illuminate everyone here. Increase their love for Jesus. Increase their trust in Jesus and also for me. And save us from our flesh and our sinful passions. And give us the power to walk in holiness and purity and love and obedience and worship. Even to the point of dying for Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. Bless this session and have your way. Save us from distractions and the children of the devil. And help me to never compromise and never fear their threats. But to fear you and to love you and trust in you, Holy Spirit. Bless them. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters and wash them in the blood of Jesus and seal them in your love forever. Holy Spirit of the living God, eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, put our hearts on fire for Jesus. Because the Lord Jesus says that's what you would do. You would guide us into all truth. You would glorify Jesus in our lives, in and through us. Holy Spirit, you are perfect. You are almighty. You are all good and all beautiful, all wise. All majestic and glorious, and we trust in you, and we love you, and we depend on you. Use us for the glory of Jesus. Bless this session, please, Holy Spirit. And strengthen my throat and my lungs and my chest with the health I need to keep using my sound to bless your servants, Holy Spirit, and make the sound of my voice pleasing to their ears. Please, Holy Spirit, please. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, eternal Spirit of the Father and of the Son, the Lord Jesus. You are the Lord and giver of life. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, God of the Father. Thank you guys for the Snapchat, the support. Thank you guys. Okay. Are we ready? It's 1.30. I got about an hour and 20 minutes, and then I go live with Al Fadi and Sira International. C I R A International. I'm going to go live with them afterwards. Thank you, Celester. Yeah. You can have pizza. Uh oh. Here we go. Act 17. You get 1500. David Hader Wood, you get 1500 on your channel. You're boring as pits. Glory to Jesus. I'm getting close to 300. Hopefully, by the end of the year, I'm going to be up to 1,000. In Jesus' name, for your glory, Lord Jesus, as you keep us holy, pure, and in love with you and provide. Okay, let's deal with the final objections raised by these Arians against the witness of Hebrews. Hopefully, by the grace of Jesus, in Jesus' name, this will be the final session on the witness of Hebrews to the Trinity, and to Jesus being Jehovah God Almighty. Hopefully. I may have to do a part two, right? Do a part two because we start a little later, and I have only an hour to unpack this. But, folks, let me give you the articles. Are you ready for the articles? This article addresses thoroughly this particular nasty Arian's objection. Here it is. Here's the article. Guys, here it is. I wrote an article addressing the objection he raised in the comment section. Here it is. I posted it three times. Guys, please click on the articles, save the articles, upload them to your, to your websites, print them out, study them, use them for the glory of Jesus. So did you get that article? Yeah, come on, guys. If we're about 270, hit that like button. Did you get that article? I posted a link three times. Yes, you can. It was never you. In fact, believe it or not, the best way to support the ministries is through our Patreon pages or PayPal, Patreon or PayPal, because believe it or not, YouTube Super, Super Chat take 13% of your donations. 30, 30%. Did I say 13? Holy Spirit save me from error. They take 30% of what you donate. But thank you because every penny counts by the grace of Jesus Christ to do the work to glorify Jesus. So thank you for the Super Chats. But the best way is Patreon or PayPal. And Magdalene, my precious sister, put the link. They take 30%, guys. When you give Super Chat, they take 30%. Not complaining. Any, any and every penny counts to do the work by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Max, I haven't done it yet. 
Max, you know why? I am so technically ignorant. I'm an ignoramus. As David Wood has said, I'm the rain man of apologetics. That's why God has blessed me, Max, with good people like Protestant Believer. Protestant has been a great blessing. He goes to my YouTube channel. He beatifies it with thumbnail. He edits it, and he doesn't get paid for it. So praise the Lord for these mods. Praise the Lord for Protestant and his family for helping me to become more technically savvy, even though he's doing the work. Okay. Did you guys save that article? Okay. Here it is. One more time. This is now four times I posted the link. Thank you, Saragon David. Not YouTube. Okay. Now, what is the objection? Are you ready for the objection? Are you guys warmed up? Pray we hit 300 today by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay. Are you ready for the objection? Are you warmed up? And dear, praise Jesus that you're a Turkey who now believes in Jesus Christ. Emphasis on Turkey. You're an oversized, good-looking Turkey. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Here's the objection. And I addressed this objection in the article, but I'm going to address it today. This Aryan heretic who was brave in the comment section, really tough and brave in the comment section, brought up the following object objection. Let's go to the King James Version of Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 9. Hopefully, when I now decimate these objections by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will see how desperate, how pathetic, how blasphemous and satanic these arguments are and how satanic and desperate these anti-Trinitarians are in their war and hatred of the true God, of the true Jesus. Okay, here's the argument. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 9. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, <clears throat> hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. What's the objection? Here's the objection. If you remember in the previous sessions, I showed that in Hebrews chapter 1, and here I got to make sure you're following me. I'm not confusing you and you understand the argument. In Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12, the Father quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, and applies it to the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why that's important in Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, and I already went in depth on that passage in the two previous sessions on Hebrews and in the article that I just linked to four times. All of this is in the article and in the two previous sessions. I went in depth, re-re-listen to those sessions and reread the article until it becomes second nature for the glory of Jesus Christ, okay? The Father quotes Psalm 102, 25, 27. And applies it to the son. He says, you, son, are that Jehovah of Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Because if you read Psalm 102, it's a psalm where the psalmist glorifies Jehovah for being the unchanging, unchangeable creator and sustainer of all creation. So if you read the psalm, the psalmist is saying to Jehovah, at the beginning... You, it's talking to Jehovah, pay attention now. You, Magdalene, if you can post the link to the PayPal, sister, I appreciate it. In Psalm 102, 25, 27, the psalmist says to Jehovah, you, at the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's not talking to a creature, he's talking to Jehovah, okay? They will wear out like a garment, you'll roll them up. They will wear out, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. So the psalmist is saying, Jehovah, you are unlike creation. In that, you created the heavens and the earth. You give life and sustain the heavens and the earth. And they are decaying. They are wearing out. <clears throat> but you remain the same. You don't decay. You don't wear out. And your years never end. So it's contrasting Jehovah as the un changeable, eternal creator of all creation with creation that changes and decays. Thank you, Tabith Bear. Right? That's Psalm 102, 25 to 27. And thanks to the mods, they put all the links to all the articles and the sessions, as well as to my patron PayPal in the description box. 
Yes, that is Layla. That's me. Christ for the World Ministries. God bless you. Okay. Did everyone get the context of Psalm 102, 25 to 27? God bless you too, Peter Orthodox. Psalm 102, 25, 27. If you read it, did you understand that Psalm 102 is not talking about a creature? It's not talking about a spirit creature or a human prophet or a human messiah. It's talking about Jehovah. And it's saying, you, Jehovah, laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They were out. You rolled them up like a garment. They will decay. But you, Jehovah, remain the same and your years never end. Now, why is that amazing? Because that very psalm and description of Jehovah is applied to the Son in Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12. The Father quotes the words of the psalm and applies it to the Son. So the Father in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 says to the Son, You, Son, are that Jehovah of Psalm 102. You are that Lord that laid the foundation of the earth, my Son. The heavens are the work of your hands, my son. They will wear out. And like a garment robe, you will <clears throat> roll them up. They will decay. But you, my son, remain the same, and your years never end, my son. So the Father glorifies Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty, the unchangeable, eternal creator of the heavens and the earth. That's Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. Now you want to hear the response? Arius, do you want me to embarrass you and your mother for giving birth to a dog like you? Do you want to call me so I can embarrass you with Isaiah 64 8 and muzzle you? Because I would love to muzzle dogs like you. I love to muzzle Arians. You're a special kind of dog, and you're a special kind of stupid. No insult to stupid people or dogs. Don't be brave in the comment section. Call me so I can muzzle you for the glory of Christ. Okay, now. I know they are, Sargon. What can I do? Because even the Bible describes these wicked, filthy demons as rabid dogs, as untamed dogs who are good for nothing but destruction. Okay. Now, you want to hear what the objection is? What's the objection to that? What do you think the Aryan objection is? And by the way, folks, when I say Aryan, let me explain my terms. Bear with me as I try to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because... My focus in these sessions is to be used of the Holy Spirit to take you to a higher level of learning as the Spirit takes me to a higher level to see the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture, the majesty of Scripture, and to be in awe of the God of Scripture. Okay. Yeah, this dog is barking. So can you muzzle him and send him on his merry, merry way? Uh, Simon, wait, 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 Simon. Are you holier than Jesus, Simon? Hold on, hold on. I'm going to muzzle another dog. Don't block Simon. Simon, are you holier than Jesus? Simon, are you holier than Jesus? Simon, answer my question quickly. I'm going to block you. Did Jesus in Matthew 7, 6 call unbelievers and blasphemers do dogs and pigs? Matthew 7, verse 6. Did Peter, an apostle of Christ, call heretics, apostates, dogs and pigs? 2 Peter 2, 22. So why don't you shut your mouth, stop pretending to be holier and more spiritual than me, and don't ask me, why am I calling human beings dogs when Jesus and his apostles called heretics and blasphemers dogs and pigs? Can you now shut up and stop pretending to be holy and spiritual before I end up embarrassing you? Okay, Simon. Now tell me how stupid you feel, Simon. Are you a special kind of stupid or just average stupid? Don't you love it, guys? Come on. Orthodox, Christians, Catholics, you got to love my style. How many teachers do you find like this? Come on now. Come on. In fact, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, please leave and don't come back, Arbor Dan, before I muzzle you too. I'm leaving. All right, now. Hold on, guys. Okay, watch here. You guys remember my friend Tony T? See, because I spend most of the time alone, okay, most of the time alone, I started now having conversations with the walls. This wall over here, I call him Tony T. This wall over here, I call him Jimmy John because for some reason when I get hungry, I always look to this wall when I'm starving. And I love some Marines. So Jimmy John started flashing in my head as I started talking to Jimmy John. Right? So that's Tony T. That's Jimmy John. And sometimes I forget my buddy's name over here. 
forgive me because I spent so much time looking this way and this way. What's your name again? What was your name? Louisa? All right, Louisa. No, no, it can't be. We got a Luis in the chat. But hold on, I want you to say, hey, Tony T, what's up, homie? Home slash, what's up? You got to admit, man, I throw down, don't I? I notice every time I say something, you be laughing. But for some reason, he's always quiet. Is it because my back is to him? It's okay, Jimmy. There, there, there. I promise you, I will never eat Subway again. Make you happy? You know, you're my home girl. My home girl, Jimmy J. Okay, Tony, what's up? Hey, remember, you owe me for going out with my lady Naomi because that wasn't something you should be doing, homie. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Okay, we're ready? We ready now? Exactly. All right. So what's the objection? What's the objection? Now, let me tell you. Let me tell you what an Aryan is. Aryan, yeah, you ain't talking COVID and cabin fever. Aryan means someone who believes like the heretic Arius. Aryan means someone who believes like the heretic Arius. Arianism means anyone who holds to a belief similar to Arius. Now, who is Arius? Those who are from the Coptic, the Nestorian, the Orthodox, the Catholic backgrounds know he is. Arius was a priest in Alexandria, Egypt, whose bishop was Alexander. Okay. Now, the Orthodox, Catholic, the rest of you, correct me why I'm wrong. I'm trusting the Spirit to enable me to recall these facts correctly. Arius was a priest in Alexandria, Egypt, who around the year 318 started teaching that Jesus is the first creature of God. That Jesus isn't eternal, meaning uncreated. That God the Father brought him into existence, the first of his creation. And that everything else was created by Jesus. And that Jesus also created the Holy Spirit. Arius also believed that Jesus did not have a human soul. Now, his bishop was Alexander. Alexander was a holy servant of Jesus and a diehard Trinitarian who was also the bishop of Athanasius. So in the year 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, at the Council of Nicaea, Athanasius met Arius with a group of 316 other bishops. There's about 318. Athanasius and Arius went at it from Scripture, both using the Bible to try to prove the other wrong. And glory to the triune God, glory to the risen Lord, who is God Almighty, eternal, not made, Athanasius schooled Arius and destroyed his perversion of the Bible. Are you with me there? See, now notice what energy did. Send energy out of here because he's preaching his, his church again. Okay. And I told you the story, and I'm going to tell it to you again. I'm going to tell it to you again. S Santa Claus was there. Santa Claus was at the Council of Nicaea. Do you know that Santa Claus was there? I ain't lying. Santa Claus is based on an actual Christian saint, a Trinitarian saint named Saint Nicholas. I'm not lying, Lisa. It's a true story. I'm not lying. Saint Nicholas is the saint from which we get the fictional character Santa Claus. Santa Claus is based on St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas was a diehard Trinitarian. He was at the council. Don't take my word for it. Go to Sheikh Google. Sheikh Google sometimes gives you Christian information. Sheikh Google. He couldn't handle what was coming out of Arius's mouth. Arius was denying that Jesus is eternal and perverting the scripture. And so... St. Nicholas had an Assyrian temper like me. He couldn't handle it. It said that out of his anger, he smacked him right in the mouth. Out of his anger, pop, right in the mouth to shut his blasphemous mouth. He hit him. He got Jilu on him. What? Right? I don't know if he was swearing in Greek or Assyrian, but he smacked the taste out of his mouth. My kindred spirit. 
Because if I was there, I would have body slammed Arius. After he smacked him, I would have grabbed him in the head and I would have done what what is it called? When you take someone or pile jump, man, I say, good day. You you agree? Tikani skesi, it is. Let me do Gino style. Agamini, dud dow. And it babu. So, so Santa Claus was naughty, not nice. Santa Claus lost it. According to the tradition, he got locked up. As he was locked up in prison, he had a vision of the Lord Jesus and his blessed mother, pretty much giving him heart and courage that what he did wasn't sin. Do you know that? And there's no reason to deny the tradition. So, so an Aryan, I'm not lying to you guys. By the way, Orthodox Catholic, am I lying? Because some of these people think I'm making it up. Am I lying? Some people think I'm making this story up. I did not. This is this is based on actual tradition. I am not lying. So Santa Claus was a diehard Trinitarian who loved the Trinity, loved Jesus so much, he couldn't even handle anyone robbing Jesus of his divine glory, and he lost it. He goes, well, that's enough, man. This guy enough. Like, he doubt. Uh, like, and doubt. Like, like, I'm cussing Jidu style. Okay. So when I say Aryan, when I say Aryan, this is what I mean. Aryan means someone who believes like Arius. Someone who believes like Arius. What did Arius believe? He believed that Jesus is the first creation of God. Thank you, Phil Khuzam. God bless you. May the trying God shine his face on you and your people and all Trinitarians all over the world for the glory of Jesus. Okay. Yeah, that was his first Christmas present. The first Christmas present that Santa Claus gave was a smack across that blasphemous mouth. You better watch out. You better not, pal. Oh, no, wait, wait. You better not, child. You better not, child. Man, I can't even. I don't remember the Christmas song. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is about to smack the taste out your mouth. So, everyone got it now? Alan, where do any heretic get the idea that the Trinity is not true and Jesus is a creature? From their wicked, corrupt, filthy minds and or the influence of Satan. Okay, so when I say Arian, I mean someone who believes like Arius. So with that said, how do they get around? How do they get around the fact that in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, the Father glorifies and praises Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty? How do I how do they get around the fact that in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, the Father glorifies and praises his son as Jehovah God Almighty? What do you think their response is? And it's in my article that I sent you the link to. What do you think their response is? Here's the article again. I just posted the link to it. Their response is to go to Hebrews 1, 8 and 9. Their response is to go to Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Let's look at Hebrews 1, 8 to 9, and I'll show you what the response is and how to refute it. Boy, was it an animated session today. Woo! You guys work me up. You know, guys, you can't be working me up too much. I may have a heart attack and leave you sooner than later. Okay, here is their objection. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So what's the objection? Ah, we got you. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 9, is quoting... Psalm 45, verses 6 to 7. It's a citation of Psalm 45, verses 6 to 7. Get, get ready for the objection. They'll tell you Psalm 45. Now, this particular heretic, this coward, who hasn't called me yet, they'll say Psalm 45 is about David. Now, other Arians will tell you it's about Solomon. 
So what's their argument? If quoting Psalm 102 and applying it to Jesus proves that Jesus is God, then when Hebrews quotes Psalm 45 and applies it to Jesus, then that proves that Jesus is David or Solomon. You understand their objection now? Psalm 45 is about David. That's what this heretic said. Other Joe's witnesses say it's about Solomon. So if Jesus is Jehovah because Psalm 102 is applied to him, then you just proved that Jesus is David or Solomon because Psalm 45, which is about David or Solomon, is applied to Jesus. See, we got you. Ha, 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 ha. So much for your argument. That's it. We got you, Sammy. Tony, shh, quiet. I love you. No subway, I promise. Okay. Do you understand the objection now? Okay. You see how they stumped us? That's it. Surprise, David. Surprise, David. Oh, you base. Surprise. Right. Do you see how they get us now? So if Psalm 102, if Psalm 102 is referring to Jehovah and applied to Jesus, and that means Jesus is now Jehovah, then Psalm 45, it's either about David or Solomon, and since it's applied to Jesus, that means you have to argue that Jesus is David or Solomon. Gotcha. Now, if you understand the objection, are you ready for the decimation of it? Are you now ready for me to refute this nonsense? So when I'm done with these objections, I promise you guys, don't take my word for it. Okay. If you learn these arguments, these arguments that we're giving you, these are battle-tested, battle-refined arguments. Arguments we've used in spiritual battle by the power of the Holy Spirit that are indestructible, irrefutable, to destroy all arguments against the Trinity if you learn them and make it second nature and use them for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, Talitha, they'll tell you Psalm 45, isn't it about David or Solomon? And you'll say yes. But it's applied to Jesus, right? Yes. So are you saying Jesus is David or Solomon? No, he isn't. So then why are you saying Jesus is Jehovah just because the Psalm about Jehovah is applied to, applied to him? So if you're ready for that objection, let's destroy it. Let's decimate this argument. Are you ready? Let's decimate this argument. Yeah, I got to do a part two, folks. Lord willing, tomorrow I got to do part two on this because I got about 40 minutes. And then I got to go live with Al Fadi on Sira International, C-I-R-A International on his YouTube channel. So listen to that and pray for that session. Okay, number one, number one. I challenge anyone reading Psalm 45, show me. And by the way, in the Greek version, the Greek version, it's Psalm 44. Here's my challenge to every one of you. Open up your Bibles. Open up your Bibles. Start at verse 1. I want someone. Now, hold on. Let me see how the Greek version reads. Let me go to the Greek version. Let me just check it out real quickly. Because, again, I'm not as familiar with the Greek, the Septuagint, as I am with English translations based on the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition. Let me just check it out. Hold on one second. And I'll give you the link to the English translation of the Greek version. Just let me get there. Let me get there. Okay. Here's my challenge for every one of you. Here is the English translation of the Greek version. I want someone to show me where in the psalm, where in the psalm, does it say this is speaking about David or Solomon? Show me where the king is said to be David or Solomon. Show me. I'm going to give you guys a minute. Where is the king named? Where does it say this is about Solomon on his wedding coronation, wedding festival, or David? Can someone check real quickly? I don't want you to take my word for it. Go and see where is the king named. Can you find it? Okay. 
No, not so much it's about Jesus. What I want you to see is, where does this psalm mention the name of the king? It doesn't. So to then say that Psalm 45 is about David or Solomon, and therefore, if it's applied to Jesus, then Trinitarian logic means Jesus has to be David or Solomon. That's desperate and pathetic because nowhere is the king identified. That's the first point. Are you ready? That's the first point. So how are you going to tell me that my method of interpreting Psalm 102 ends up proving Jesus is David or Solomon because Psalm 45 is not about David or Solomon and now applied to Jesus so that if I'm consistent, I have to now say Jesus is David or Solomon. Where does it even mention the name of the king? It doesn't. So that pathetic objection goes out the window. Number two, here's the second problem. Here's the second problem. Are you ready for the second problem? Are you ready for the second problem? Let me know if you're ready. The second problem is the psalm is talking about the specific characteristics, functions, and titles of the king of Israel. Okay, this you got to get this point. The psalm is talking about the specific characteristics functions and titles of the king of Israel. As such, those titles, those qualities are not unique to one individual because anyone who's king, anyone that rules over Israel <clears throat> will by nature share in those qualities and functions. In other words, it's an office, an office shared by many, not an office limited to one person. So if you are king of Israel, then anything and everything said about the king will apply to you because kingship is not unique to one individual. Being the king of Israel was a privilege given to David and his sons. As such, it's not a privilege given to only one person. It's like the president of the United States. Just because Donald Trump is the president doesn't make Donald Trump Barack Obama. Just because Barack Obama is the president doesn't make him George Washington because the office of president of the United States is occupied by many people. It's not unique to one individual. Exactly, Christos and Esti. And it's also a psalm celebrating the wedding feast of the king of Israel with a particular bride from the daughter of Tyre. Now, unless you want to show that only one king in Israel's history married a daughter of Tyre. You're getting pretty desperate, aren't you? Are you with me there? You understand what I'm saying? To be the king of Israel means you share specific qualities, functions, and roles in common with others because the king of Israel was in a position occupied by one individual. It's an office occupied by many individuals in the history of Israel. That's why it's applied to Christ. Why? Because Jesus is also the king of Israel. So like the kings before him, he shares those specific qualities, roles, and functions that the kings before him also shared in, but he is the greatest of all the kings. But that office is not unique to him. I'm going to go very slow on this point, and I'm not going to go fast on it until you get it. No, that King of Kings is a unique title that belongs only to Jehovah because you can only have one King of Kings reigning from heaven, happy-go-lucky. No, it's not the same. King of Kings is a unique title that belongs only to Jehovah because you can only have one King of Kings in heaven. Whoever is the King of Kings in heaven must be Jehovah because Jehovah alone is the king of kings in heaven. That's a different title. Don't confuse yourself, happy-go-lucky. Focus. King of Israel. Was there only one king of Israel or are there many kings of Israel? 
I'm going to go very slow on this. Believe me, I'm not going to rush. And I'm going to repeat it again, God willing, tomorrow. Because I want to make sure you get educated, you know your faith, and have no doubt. The Bible screams, God is the Trinity. The Trinity is God, and Jesus is the God-man. Sergio, do you want me to send you on your merry way? Do you want me to get, get you out of here or no? Yeah, same time tomorrow, Max. God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so let's repeat. Psalm 45, the thing said about the king in his beauty, in his power, in his strength, in the roles that he assumes as king are not unique to one individual. Anyone who is the king of Israel also shares in those qualities, functions, and roles that any and every king of Israel possessed. Are you with me there? You with me there? So kingship is not unique. King of Israel is not something unique that only one individual possesses. It is not a function attributed to only one individual. Because in the history of Israel, they had many kings. So the qualities of the king of Israel would be true of any king of Israel, especially if he's God-fearing. Because God expected all the kings of Israel to be mighty, to be bold, to be holy, to be righteous, to be pure, to be God-fearing, to stand in the place of God, represent God, and be God in that sense as God's representative. Tim, don't let Sergio distract you with something stupid and silly that has nothing to do with my talk because I'm going to block him. So then why would Psalm 45 be applied to Jesus if in Psalm 45 it wasn't initially about Jesus? Okay. Why is Psalm 45 applied to Jesus when Psalm 45 in its historical context wasn't about Jesus? Do you know why? Because Psalm 45 is describing the king of Israel, an office that is occupied by more than one individual. Therefore, any individual who assumes that office must possess those qualities or live up to those roles and characteristics. No, Christos NST. You went too far, buddy. You're going too far. Stay. Teddy, are you one dog or three dogs? Are you one filthy rat scum or three filthy rat scum? What are you? And I don't know why the mods are letting this guy just distract and sit there. Mods, do you get paid nothing for nothing? So sit there and look pretty? Okay. Are you with me there? All right. So let's try this again. You see why I'm going very slow on this? Psalm 45 is talking about the king of Israel and the qualities, the roles, and the function that the king of Israel assumes. Since there isn't one king of Israel, but many, that means the, the qualities, the characteristics, the roles, and the function of the king of Israel would apply to any and every king of Israel because these are the qualities the roles and the function that God expected every king to possess and live up to. Let me give you the analogy of the president of the United States again. The president of the United States, right, possesses certain responsibilities, characteristics, certain functions that he has to carry out. Okay. But since that office, President of the United States, isn't an office only assigned to one individual in history because there have been many presidents of the United States, that means any and every president of the United States must live up to those characteristics and responsibilities, roles, and functions that go with that office. Therefore, Donald Trump can be the president of the United States without being Barack Obama. Barack Obama can be the president of the United States without being George Washington because the president of the United States is not a role assigned to one individual. It is an office assumed by many individuals. 
Likewise with the role of king of Israel. So why is Psalm 45 applied to Jesus? Because he is Israel's perfect king, ideal king, and therefore what was said about all the kings before him and what all the kings had to be and all the characteristics they had to possess and the roles that they had to assume and the responsibilities they had to live up to, Jesus perfectly sums up in his own person. Are you with me there? Yeah, get rid of him if he's going to be a distraction. Do you understand why Psalm 45 is applied to Jesus? Number one, Psalm 45 doesn't tell us who that king is. David or Solomon or Hezekiah, we don't know. It's irrelevant. Number two, the things said about the king of Israel aren't true of only one individual. They would be true of any and every king of Israel because these qualities are qualities that God expects all the kings of Israel to possess and live up to. So I repeated this point more than 10 minutes. I hope I'm not boring you guys. I hope I'm not losing you guys. I hope we increase, not decrease. Okay? Did it sink in before I move on? I can't move on if you're not getting it. See, we're dropping people like flies. We're up to 280. We're losing it. So if someone tells you, well, then that means Jesus must be David or Solomon because Psalm 45 is applied to him. That shows that person either is an ignoramus or he's a dishonest son of Satan. Why? Because Psalm 45 isn't referring to a specific individual, meaning it doesn't say this is David or Solomon. It's referring to the king of Israel. And that's an office assumed by many human beings, starting with David. In fact, even before David, it was Saul. So Psalm 45 can be applied to Jesus without this making Jesus David or Solomon, because the things said about the king of Israel are not unique to David or Solomon. They would be characteristics that every king had to possess. Right? So does that mean... Just because Psalm 102 is applied to Jesus, that still doesn't mean Jesus is Jehovah. Because that's the argument. Just because Psalm 102 is applied to Jesus doesn't make him Jehovah. Just like Psalm 45 being applied to Jesus doesn't make him David or Solomon. Does that follow? Okay, send Sergio out of here. He's got to get out of here. Send him out of here. Block him, please, quick. Okay, who didn't get what I'm saying here? Because if you're not getting it, I can't finish the point. I'm going to end the session and do it tomorrow. I got to make sure you're getting it. Because if you don't get this objection, you won't be able to silence the blasphemies against the Trinity. You won't. You won't be able to. Okay. So is it invalid for me to say that Psalm 102... Being applied to Jesus proves that he's Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. No. But hold on. Psalm 45 is applied to Jesus and doesn't make Jesus David or Solomon. That's a false analogy of false comparison. Do you know why? Are you now ready to see why? And I'm going to go back in depth on this tomorrow. I got to do part two. Yeah. Do you know why? Because you can be the king of Israel without being David or Solomon. Just like you can be the president of the United States without being Barack Obama. But you cannot be the unchangeable creator, sustainer of all creation if you're not Jehovah. Do you know why? Unlike the king of Israel, there's only one creator and sustainer of all creation who doesn't change. Jehovah God. This is the false analogy. How many creators, sustainers of all creation do you have that are unchangeable? Only one. But how many kings of Israel do you have? More than one. 
Do you see why I told you it's a pathetic argument? You cannot be, you cannot be the creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth if you're not Jehovah. But you can be king of Israel without being David. This is why I said the guy's stupid and the coward doesn't call me. You see? It is one of the most pathetic objections in the world. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, when you hear someone say that, you should laugh at the level of dishonesty, deceit, and or stupidity. You can be the king of Israel without having to be David or Solomon. Like Donald Trump can be the president of the United States without being Barack Obama. But you cannot be the creator and sustainer of all creation if you're not Jehovah. Because unlike the king of Israel, there's only one creator and sustainer of all creation, Jehovah God Almighty. There isn't another. You with me there? What do I care if it's not about Jesus? Charlie, which part of Psalm 45 is about the king of Israel? So if you ask Tovia Singer, uh, Tovia, if the Messiah becomes king of Israel, would Psalm 45 apply to him as a king of Israel? And Tovia would say yes. Thank you, Tovia. Since Jesus is Messiah, it applies to him. Just because you don't believe he's the Messiah doesn't mean anything. I don't believe you're human. I believe you're a fat, overweight, disgusting, brain, dumbass. You see? Yeah, I will, Manuel. Just be with me. Just be patient. Charlie, the reason why he says it's not about Jesus because he doesn't believe Jesus is Messiah. But Charlie, ask Tobias Singer, if Messiah comes, is he not the king of Israel? Yes. So Psalm 45 wouldn't apply equally to him in an ultimate sense. As the king of Israel, he'll say yes. Well, thank you. If Jesus is Messiah, then it applies to him. But you're the brain dumb fat ass, and I mean ass meaning donkey, jackass, even though asses are smarter than this dog. And dogs are cleaner than him. Then that means it is about Jesus because he's the Messiah, whether you like it or not. Right? Okay. You know, I'm going to do part two tomorrow, but you're going to have to pray for me, right? Pray tomorrow. Holy Spirit fills all of us. The Holy Spirit seals us, keeps us pure and holy in love with Jesus. And that the Holy Spirit protects us from any more satanic distractions. Guys, notice. When I want to do something deep and mind-blowing, we get attacked. Pray the Lord will protect us tomorrow so that I start live stream and go right into it. Because for the remainder of the time now, I'm just going to reinforce this in your mind until it sinks in and go back and read my article. Here it is. And I'll leave back on tomorrow, God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Lord willing, when I'm done with this, then I'm going to talk about being born of water and spirit, God willing. Here's the article again. All of what I told you is in that article. Okay, and pray for my daughters that God will reunite my daughters to me and protect us from harm in Jesus' name. Okay, now follow with me again. Do you understand why Psalm 45 can be applied to Jesus without making him David or Solomon or Hezekiah? Right? Do you understand why it can be applied to him without this making him David or Solomon? Because the king of Israel is not one individual. The king of Israel is a position and office occupied by many individuals. So the qualities ascribed to that king in Psalm 45 would be qualities that all the kings of Israel had to possess and live up to. And who's the ultimate fulfillment of that? Jesus. Because unlike any other king who were sinners who failed to live up to that description, he perfectly fulfills it. Not just as a man, but he is what they're not, God in the flesh. And I'll unpack that a little more. Tomorrow. Okay, but, but you can be a king of Israel and not be David or Solomon, but you cannot be the Lord who was there at the beginning, who laid the foundations of the earth, who made the heavens by his own hands, who then rolls them up because he sustains all creation. And unlike creation remains the same, whose years never end if you're not Jehovah. Why? Only Jehovah is the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Only Jehovah 
is the Lord who sustains all creation. Only Jehovah remains unchangeable by nature, whose years never end, unlike creation, which wears out and decays. So for that to be applied to Jesus, he has to be Jehovah. Otherwise, you cannot ascribe those qualities to him. Jehovah alone is unchangeable. Jehovah alone is the creator and sustainer of all creation. To then apply to Jesus, he has to be Jehovah or it's misapplied because that cannot be applied to a creature. But here's where it gets amazing. Though it's applied to Jesus, Jesus is not the only one who's Jehovah because the Father and the Spirit are Jehovah too. So here's what's beautiful. Though Psalm 102 is applied to Jesus, and by applying to the Jesus, he has to be Jehovah. At the same time, he's not the Father, because the Father is saying these things to the Son, and yet the Father himself is Jehovah. So welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. Did you catch it? So let me repeat it again. How many beings are there who are unchangeable by nature, who years never end, who created and sustains all creation? How many beings are there of that type? Only one. Exactly, Manuel Flores. Only one. So... If that passage that describes the unique characteristics of God as the unchangeable, eternal creator, sustainer of all creation is applied to Jesus, then he has to be Jehovah God Almighty. Otherwise, it cannot be applied to him. But at the same time, who's applying it to him? The Father. And we know the Father is Jehovah God. So that means Psalm 102 equally applies to the Father. And to his son, and I'm going to show you tomorrow, God willing, to the Holy Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. Because the things said about God in Psalm 102 cannot be said of any creature. Jehovah alone created all things. Jehovah alone sustains all things. Jehovah alone is immutable, unchangeable by nature, unlike creation, which grows and changes throughout time. Therefore, Psalm 102 can only be applied to Jehovah alone, but it's applied to the Son. That means he's Jehovah. But the Son is not the Father, and the Father is Jehovah, and the Holy Spirit is Jehovah. But they're not three Jehovahs, because there's only one Jehovah. So if the Father is Jehovah, and the Son is Jehovah, and the Spirit is Jehovah, but the Father and the Son and the Spirit are not the same person, that means the one Jehovah exists as a trinity oh wow welcome to the wonderful world of the trinity you get it now see even muhammad ibn jars who's leaving islam and following what jesus and reading the bible even he said it makes sense did you catch it so, you know, the Holy Spirit's working in Muhammad. He's seeing it. And he just started following the faith and reading the Bible. That tells you that the Bible so clearly teaches the Trinity that if someone is honest to God and has his eyes and ears open and doesn't impose his view on the Bible, he can see as clear as day that the God of the Bible is triune. Here is a man who came out of Islam who comes to the Bible without any traditions that hinders him from allowing the Bible to say what it says. And he says, oh, man, that makes sense. I see it. Yeah, you're right. This is only true of Jehovah. And if the Father applies it to the Son, that means Jesus is Jehovah Almighty. But if the Father is not the Son, and the Father is saying this to the Son, and the Father is also Jehovah, that means the one Jehovah God is more than one person. He's the Father and the Son with the Spirit. No wonder you Christians are Trinitarians. You get it? So I'm going to repeat this point for the next 10 minutes because i got 10 more minutes with you guys. And I'm going to do part two tomorrow. So this now should prepare your minds and your hearts for tomorrow. Pray that we're filled with the Spirit, no distractions. 
nothing distracts us, no attacks of the enemy to depress me and sideline me, but we're shielded by the Spirit and covered by the blood of Jesus, so he can be ready tomorrow, God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because I'm going to go over this again. Okay, so everyone understood that you can take a psalm about the king of Israel and apply it to Jesus without this making Jesus David or Solomon. Because the thing said about the king of Israel there, his boldness, his fierceness, his courage, being mighty in battle, his beauty, his holiness, his righteousness are characteristics that are true of all the kings of Israel. All the kings of Israel must live up to those qualities and responsibilities. How much more Jesus being the fulfillment of those qualities when he's perfectly human and perfectly God. Right? Everyone get it? What the heck was on that? Yo. Sorry. Somebody make a noise outside. Everyone getting it? Sound like a firecracker outside. Got scared for a minute. Okay. But... You cannot take, let me repeat this again so it can sink in. You cannot take the qualities that are only true of God. God and God alone is uncreated. God and God alone is unchangeable by nature. God and God alone created all creation and gives life to all creation. Those are characteristics that define God and only God and cannot be ascribed to a creature because those are the characteristics that separate God from creation. You with me there? So if I were to tell you Christians, what makes God separate from creation? You tell me he's uncreated. Okay? You tell me that he's unchangeable by nature. He remains the same. You tell me his years never end. He doesn't grow old and wear out. You tell me he's the creator and sustainer of all creation. So those are the characteristics that define God and distinguish him from creation, those characteristics cannot be ascribed to a creature, right? Right? So then, can I ask you a question? How can the psalm that describes Jehovah as uncreated by nature, as unchangeable by nature, who doesn't grow old and wear out, who created and sustains all creation, be applied to Jesus if Jesus is the first of God's creatures. You can't apply it to him. It would be blasphemy. Guy, are you there? Protestant, I want you to save this. Folks, rejoice with me how God is using us, imperfect sinners like us, like me, to glorify the name of Jesus and bring Muslims to faith. Look what Muhammad Ibn Jadis just said. I can understand why the Trinity was used to explain what the Bible is teaching without needing the exact word to be used within it. Okay, folks, what excuse do the heretics, the Arians, the Unitarians, the modalists have for not seeing what the Bible teaches when here you have a Muslim who left Islam studying the Bible, and he just said, Muhammad ibn Jars, I can understand why the Trinity was used to explain what the Bible is teaching without needing the exact word to be used within it. Tell me this man doesn't sound like a Trinitarian. Andrew, why are you going LOL? I don't get it. What's LOL? You're getting excited. Keep doing LOL. Amen, Ibn al-Khan. Because you know why? He came out of Islam and opened his heart to God by the power of the Holy Spirit prompting him and convicting him and leading him. And he came to God without any restrictions. Ibn Muhammad Ibn Jaris came to God saying, look, whoever you are, I'll accept you. If you are the Trinity, I'll accept you. If Jesus is God in the flesh, I'll accept you. I won't put any restrictions on you. Let me see the truth. And because he came with an open heart, he sees the Trinity jumping out of the pages of God's word because he didn't put any limits on what God can and cannot be. Right? 
So did this whet your appetite for part two? Was this still a session that blessed you, challenged you, encouraged you, and wowed you to see how deep the Bible is, how amazing the Bible is, how majestic the Bible is, and how real the God of the Bible is, and that God is a trinity. Now, folks, we're up to 280. We went down to 226. You're breaking my heart. I don't want the number to go down. I want it to go up. So pray for that in Jesus' name. So Lord willing, go back, right? Re-listen to this and be prepared for tomorrow and pray. Because guess what happens, folks? Every time and any time I'm about to preach something deep, Satan attacks me to discourage me, get me depressed, to sideline me. Pray against that. Ask Jesus to cover me and my daughters by his blood. Seal us by the spirit. Save us from all attacks of Satan, especially when we go live. No more distractions. Rebuke that in Jesus' name. And be prepared tomorrow spiritually, emotionally, and physically by being prayed up and meditate on the word and praise God. Remember the goal of the Christian. The goal of the Christian. It's not just to know the Bible. Your goal is to know the Bible so you can believe it, love it, Live it out by the power and strength of the Holy Spirit and proclaim it. So the goal of the Christian is to know the Bible in order to know the God of the Bible, in order to love the God of the Bible, trust in the God of the Bible, praise and worship the God of the Bible, live for the God of the Bible, carry out the will of the God of the Bible, and make him known until Jesus takes us home, whether that means we die and enter his presence or he comes down. Right? And be assured, the God of the Bible is real. The God of the Bible lives. He is life. Because if there was no God, there'd be no life. Contrary to what the atheists will tell you. And the God of the Bible is triune. The God of the Bible is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And one of the persons of the God of the Bible became man from the blessed womb of the blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that man is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the God-man who died and rose again and can never die ever again, who sits enthroned as the God-man, the King of kings, Lord of lords, one with the Father in spirit, in essence, in glory, in nature, in power, in majesty, in worship. And that God-man is in love with us, and may we be in love with him, and he will return to the earth in his glorious physical body and reign over all creation, and destroy all evil, wickedness, and death. And we who love him will live with him in incorruptible bodies forever and ever, being flooded in his infinite love, joy, and peace. No more pain, no more suffering, no more misery, no more Satan, no more death. And that will happen because he is real, he lives, he's alive. So I end it with the words. I end it with these words. And don't forget tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing, part two. And then in 20 minutes from now, Sira International, C-I-R-A, I go live again 20 minutes from now. Let me end it with the words of Jesus. Let me end it with the words of Jesus. And guys, pray for me. Back me up with your love and my daughters with your love by your prayers and your fasting and pray for the provision. So let's end it with these words. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Let's end it with these words. Revelation 1, 17, 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am the living one, he that lives. I became dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus, you are the first and the last. You died and you destroyed death, destroyed the grave, conquered Satan and sin, and you live forevermore and you cannot die. You are now deathless and you have power over death and Hades. And we trust in you. We love you. We live in you and we believe in you. We love you, son of God. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on my daughters. Fight for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. See you in 20 minutes. Sierra International. C-I-R-A International. 20 minutes I go live. Pray for my health, my throat, and my daughters, and the provision. I love you guys. Remember this. 
Jesus is in love with you, and that's what matters because his love is almighty to save you. My love can't do anything, but his love has done everything. And may we be in love with him. We love you, Lord Jesus. Take care.